If you've started your own side hustle or business and you're getting ready to go, this video is important to your financial success. If you don't have a business structure designed to minimize taxes, reduce financial liabilities, protect against lawsuits, and hide your assets from the prying eyes of competitors or nosy family members, you're losing to your competition. The business structure we're gonna to discuss today is a holding company with subsidiaries. Stick around. We're demystifying the ins and outs of what a holding company really is, how it all works, and why any rational entrepreneur will prioritize implementing this structure for their business. Quick disclaimer, I am a licensed attorney, but I am not your attorney, and this is not legal advice. I am a believer of meritocracy, and in a fair system, information should be disseminated and available for all people who want success and are willing to work for it. This is Rich from The Financial Verdict. Let's get started. First off, what is a holding company? A holding company is a financial organization, usually set up as a corporation or a limited liability company, that holds the controlling stock of other companies and assets. They're also referred to as an umbrella company or a parent company. The companies owned by the holding company are called subsidiaries. The holding company does not and should not take part in the business activities of the subsidiaries outside of its inherent function to hold, buy, and control the ownership interests of those subsidiaries. This bears repeating because this is the most common mistake I see business owners make. The function of a pure holding company is solely as a vehicle for ownership, chiefly profit collection and redistribution. It's an entity whose only job is to acquire, sell, and financially manage your segregated operations. A holding company should not engage in other business activities. The structure we're gonna to cover today is what's called a pure holding company and its subsidiary LLCs. It's generally suboptimal for most small business structures to be parked in a mixed holding company, which is a holding company that also engages in its own business operations or is directly engaged with the business operations of its subsidiaries, such as commingling of assets or transactions. It is suboptimal because doing so will pierce much of the legal and financial protections a pure holding company offers. For a majority of small businesses, many businesses with less than 50 million in average annual gross receipts, a holding company typically owns multiple subsidiaries that are segregated by the business functions to minimize liability, fees, and taxes while maximizing profits. For medium-sized operation or larger, generally meaning anything over 50 but under $1 billion in annual gross receipts, the current best practice is setting up multinational offshore IP holdings that are also compartmentalized by division, but that exceeds the scope of today's topic. Only reason I'm bringing this up is because I can already hear people commenting, but Berkshire Hathaway utilizes another protocol. Why not mimic that? Absolutely. A holding company like Berkshire Hathaway is going to be more sophisticatedly designed and as a result be able to leverage more of both asset protection and savings than the model I'm showing today. Why not model your small business after a multi-billion dollar conglomerate? Until you're ready to spend tens of millions annually in legal fees, sticking with a basic and easy setup will provide you substantial benefits that's simple and affordable to implement and maintain. Guys, even if this is the first time you've been exposed to any of these concepts, understand that outside of the initial learning curve, this is easy. It's not rocket science. And I always tell people, it's just one of the many threshold tests. If entrepreneurs won't spend the time and effort to figure this out to set up a solid foundation for their financial success, chances are they will fail to successfully problem solve and navigate major roadblocks in whatever business they're in. Setting up a holding company with subsidiaries is easy and you don't need to be rich to benefit greatly from it. Let's go over why with the following example. Let's outline a basic setup within the United States. Let's introduce the hero of our story, Wayne. Wayne recently quit his career and opened a coffee shop with his savings. He named it King Bucks Coffee. He is paying down the mortgage on two of his personal properties. The first is his home property where he resides and the second is a small commercial window pane business front where he situated his coffee shop. How would Wayne minimize taxes, reduce financial liabilities, protect against lawsuits and hide asset ownership and financial visibility? Now, this example is just one possibility to cover a multitude of principles. Your operation does not have to look anything like this or be as diverse for a holding structure to deliver benefit. Like many entrepreneurs, Wayne will do well to form a business entity called an LLC, a limited liability company in Wyoming. 
even if he's never been to Wyoming and his coffee shop and residential home are located in a different state. Why Wyoming? It doesn't have to be Wyoming, but it's a great pick. Wayne's ownership of the holding company will not be public information there. Wyoming provides arguably the highest level of privacy possible for a business owner in the United States. No one would know that Wayne owns a holding company or the assets within unless he discloses that information himself. Of course, there are circumstances where disclosure can be compelled and made public, such as in certain stages of litigation or criminal proceedings. Barring a circumstance out of the ordinary, good guy Wayne would also enjoy minimum reporting and disclosure requirements by the state. Wayne would incur no state income tax for his businesses in Wyoming. Let that sink in, no state income tax. Wyoming also has arguably the best asset protection and limited liability in the country. It's important to note that Delaware also has very favorable laws for LLCs and no corporate income tax and has a developed pro-business court system that is specifically designed to adjudicate business disputes. But in Wayne's circumstance, because his operations are still relatively small scale, Wyoming is more favorable because it's more important to him to have a state that is cheaper in startup costs and fewer legal requirements. In Wyoming, ownership of an LLC is easily transferable and an existing out-of-state LLC can be moved into Wyoming with minimum hassle. Wayne also enjoys the benefits of low startup costs, just $100 to form and $60 per year with $2 electronic processing fee when done straight through the state. After Wayne forms his holding company LLC, he may elect to have Holdco be treated as taxable as an S-Corp or C-Corp, depending on his needs and wants. Wayne would consider his business model, the size and scope of his operations, how many employees he has, his pay structure, whether he intends to take on investors or go IPO, the list goes on. We'll make a separate video on this in the future as it's quite a large topic. Wayne would keep his coffee shop operating company, King Bucks Coffee, in the state the business is physically operating in, but transfer the ownership of the LLC to his holding company in Wyoming. If he had already set up King Bucks Coffee LLC, depending on the state laws of where King Bucks is incorporated, he may not be able to transfer ownership of the business directly. Instead, he may be required to dissolve the LLC and create a new LLC under the holding company as its sole owner. Any assets will then transfer in between the LLCs by operation of law. If it's a business that Wayne is acquiring from a third party, the action of the transfer of assets are defined by the LLC by sell agreement. For reasons we'll discuss, Wayne ensures that his holding company owns 100% of the total shares of each subsidiary. That is because 100% owned subsidiaries may be treated as disregarded entities for tax purposes, and therefore, no separate tax returns must be filed, yet corporate liability protections remain. At no time will Wayne allow a subsidiary to be owned by his holding company, where it does not own at least 80% of total shares. For those types of investments, such as angel investments, He'll park it separately under a different structure. Wayne now creates a second LLC in Wyoming where, as we covered, has favorable laws and no state taxes, and he names it King Bucks Coffee IP. He uses this LLC to apply for trademarks with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. The name of his coffee, the coffee's logo and associated graphics, the name of the flavors of his different blends, and the slogans used to market the coffee. Then, he drafts a licensing agreement between King Bucks Coffee IP in Wyoming and King Bucks Coffee in his home state. King Bucks Coffee IP, the licensor, will permit King Bucks Coffee, the licensee, to use this trademark or brand in return for payment of a royalty. Trademark royalties can be defined in a variety of ways but are often contracted as a percentage of gross or net sales or as a fixed fee per unit sold or produced. What is Wayne doing? He is intentionally setting up a liability in King Bucks Coffee and distributing it as payment or profit to King Bucks Coffee IP in Wyoming. Now, King Bucks Coffee as a subsidiary has less assets to lose in catastrophic litigation. Wayne is minimizing his frontline assets. Wayne can remove another asset from King Bucks Coffee's book by setting up a properly executed lease agreement with Shop Property LLC, another subsidiary wholly owned by the holding company. By doing so, he's also making sure that the business does not own the building. This concept bears repeating. Never, never allow a business entity to directly own the building it is operating in. Let's say a catastrophic event such as, I don't know, a coffee machine exploded and paralyzed 16 customers and two employees. 
<laughs> Obviously, it's a hyperbolic example, but trust me, stranger and more unexpected situations and therefore lawsuits have happened. This will probably blow right through Wayne's measly $5 million in business liability coverage. His store will probably have to close. The assets of King Buck's Coffee will probably get liquidated from the subsequent lawsuit. But let's look at what's actually happened. His property is owned by Shop Property LLC, not King Buck's Coffee. If the lease agreement regarding liability and distribution of responsibility was set up correctly, and if there was never commingling, and if the holding company structure was set up correctly, Shop Property LLC, and therefore his real property, is not on the line. Proper maintenance of his coffee machine is the legal responsibility of King Buck's Coffee LLC and not Shop Property LLC. So what assets are actually liquidated? Not much. After paying King Buck's Coffee IP for the rights to use his intellectual property after every sale, paying Shop Property LLC for the lease, paying his employee salary, and paying for all operating expenses of the business, Wayne's exposure is merely the physical assets owned by King Buck's Coffee, like tables, chairs, decor, mugs, coffee makers, and whatever liquidity was in King Buck's Coffee's expense account. If Wayne's been paying attention to me, there shouldn't be much in there. Why is King Buck's Coffee IP not on the line? That's because by segregating the two business entities, King Buck's Coffee IP had nothing to do whatsoever with the business side of selling coffee. It does not hire baristas, does not purchase coffee machines, does not pay rent for the store, does not tell King Buck's Coffee what to do. King Buck's Coffee IP only holds the trademark and bills businesses for the contractual privilege of using those trademarks. And the key here is that it does nothing else and therefore is not subject to any judgment. It's worth mentioning, again, that even though Wayne's holding company can own the intellectual property on King Buck's Coffee directly, it should not. You want the holding company itself to be as hard to legally target as possible. You want potential plaintiffs to run into what litigators call standing or nexus threshold problems so that it can't get sued. If all was done correctly, Wayne's core assets are intact. He's not personally liable, his other LLCs are not liable, and only one business takes the hit. Wayne lives to fight another day. Imagine if Wayne had parked all his assets into one LLC, or God forbid, no LLC at all. Everything he had ever worked for would be in jeopardy. Now, what critical things did Wayne remember to do that did not allow his adversaries to pierce his corporate veil and go after his other assets? He ensured that none of his subsidiaries acted in concert, none of his subsidiaries commingled their funds or performed a function of another business, ever. That means at a minimum, every LLC has separate accounts, separate credit cards, separate debit cards, separate expense charts, and every LLC pays its own bills and stays in its own lane with every single transaction. When business owners get lazy, that's where commingling starts to happen. That's where people start to get into legal trouble, tax trouble, audit trouble, liability trouble. Speaking of taxes, if he hasn't done so already, Wayne transfers ownership of his home property that is directly owned by him to Home LLC, which is owned by his holding company. Now, there are a couple of major caveats for Wayne here. I bring this up because I see a lot of so-called financial gurus out there suggesting this, but I rarely see the drawbacks discussed. And they are there and they can be significant. There are many factors to consider depending on the financial situation of the individual and their state of residence. Here are four important factors Wayne considers. First, before transferring ownership of his primary residence into an LLC, Wayne checked the laws of the state regarding the homestead exemption, which exempts creditors' rights to obtain equity in a primary residence. Wayne weighs the pros and cons carefully as he stands to lose that exemption for his residence upon transfer of ownership. Depending on the state, a homestead exemption may reduce tax obligation, protect against a forced sale during bankruptcy, and may even provide a surviving spouse with tax relief. Second, since there is still outstanding financing on the property, Wayne checked the due on sale clause in his mortgage note and other legal relevant documents. A due on sale clause is a requirement in a mortgage agreement that the outstanding loan be paid in full if the house or asset is resold. Wayne noticed he is bound by a due on sale clause, so he contacted his lending institution and negotiated a mortgage rider, 
which allowed him to move his property without triggering the due on sale clause if he agreed to remain personally fully obligated on the original note. Third, Wayne checked his existing hazard insurance coverage to ensure he would still be covered after the transition. The rates and conditions of insurance coverage changes depending on if the property is owned by a business entity as opposed to it being owned as a primary residence. Last but certainly not least, Wayne checked the state laws regarding the tax consequences of this move. State laws on property tax varies tremendously. This is a really big topic here that I've truncated, but the takeaway here is that the solo entrepreneur should consult a competent lawyer and a financial advisor before proceeding. This move isn't for everyone. Since Wayne is particularly entrepreneurial, he creates another LLC in Wyoming, and he calls it e-commerce LLC, and sets up a lease between e-commerce LLC and home LLC. He converts a spare bedroom of his home into a dedicated office, which he exclusively designates for work on his e-commerce business. It's worth noting that in some states, using a home address or home office for a business is a significant factor the court considers in a litigation when determining whether the corporate veil has been pierced. But different businesses have different inherent risks. While a rational entrepreneur like Wayne may use a home office for a solo e-commerce business, he wouldn't, for example, use his home and garage as an unloading and storage point for his goods. The legal risks associated with parking a laptop and a printer in a room and using a mailbox in a common area is dramatically different than using a home office as a place where customers or employees will congregate for a business function. However, using a home office as a departing point has significant perks when writing off business expenses, especially for travel. His trips to Asia where he toured manufacturers and negotiated MOQs. His meeting in Europe where he attended conferences and master classes. They're business trips and much of it can be written off as business expenses. The fact that he incidentally also toured the Louvre on his business trip is just an added bonus. Does the municipality where King Buck's Coffee operate have a tax break incentive for businesses with a certain type of merchandise? Wayne creates a contract between King Buck's Coffee and e-commerce LLC to display and sell some of those products to take advantage of every single government concession. Every time Wayne takes a client, an employee, a consultant out to a meal or a night of entertainment, 50% tax deduction. Wayne remembers to keep the date, location, relationship to the person he dined with, and the total cost as part of his records in case of audit. All his travel expenses we mentioned, airfare, hotels, rental cars, tips, meals, dry cleaning, the list goes on, business expense. His own vehicle at 56 cents a mile, to and from his places of business, business insurance, his home office up to 300 square feet, office supplies, Printers, paper, pen, software, phone, internet, lawyer, accountants, childcare, business expenses. Now here's the best part. Wayne wants to open a new business. Let's say it's a restaurant. He forms Restaurant LLC and takes the money he made from all his other businesses that his holding company is currently keeping in its account and invests it into the restaurant. Because Wayne files one consolidated tax return for all his subsidiaries through his holding company, much of that reinvestment of liquidity from profitable subsidiaries into new subsidiaries through his holding company prior to distribution can be written off. Wayne gets to continue to create entrepreneurial value in different subsidiaries through his holding company indefinitely while minimizing tax obligations. Why? Because his holding company owns 100% of each subsidiary LLC. The LLCs are considered pass-through entities or disregarded entities, and the taxes the holding company would have owed on its profits are being reinvested as expenditures in this new subsidiary. What are you doing right now? Does this sound familiar to you at all? You get paid for your hard labor. You pay taxes on your paycheck. You invest in the market or your side hustle, some of your residual after you pay those taxes, and then you pay taxes again if you earn. Why? All to risk losing every bit of it when you get sued? This is the basic principle behind the financial legal structure you need before building your fortunes to protect it, save capital, and to expand it efficiently and effectively. This is the prerequisite of wealth building. Using this structure, Wayne is able to effectively manage his reinvestment and 
payout structure every fiscal quarter from his holding company to himself directly. In some circumstances, Wayne may wish for his trust to be the direct owner of his holding company, which then distributes its earnings to designated beneficiaries. We'll discuss under what circumstances that becomes a pragmatic option in a future video. To finish up, here are some hard rules Wayne always remembers to follow. Rule number one, Wayne never commingles funds between his LLCs and never commingles personal funds with business funds. Most business owners know to never commingle business and personal funds, which other than making your bookkeeping and taxes much more onerous to perform, it will result in piercing the corporate veil during litigation, which means that your personal assets can potentially be on the line. Similar concept here applies to a holding company and its subsidiaries. If your holding company is performing part of the business function of a subsidiary, meaning that the activities of the businesses are not carefully sequestered to delineate performance of the business function by the business only and mere oversight by the holding company, potentially a good plaintiff attorney can and will successfully sue both entities and recover. At the very least, you would have to pay a civil defense attorney more money in pretrial motions on why your holding company should not be liable for the actions of its subsidiary. Maintain careful lines of demarcation. Don't cross function or pay out of the wrong account. Not even once. On the other side of the coin of that rule, Wayne always keeps records of every single financial transaction. From my observations, commingling rarely comes from ignorance. It comes from laziness and complacency. Since Wayne is a meticulous record keeper, it's unlikely he'll ever commingle. Rule number two, when acquiring a new subsidiary under the holding company, Wayne prefers 100% ownership, but never accepts any ownership interest under 80%. That's not to say that Wayne should not actively seek out lucrative minority ownership interests in other businesses. He definitely should but it should be parked under a different financial structure and not his holding company that owns his primary assets. That's because only when the holding company owns 80% or more of a subsidiary stock is it not paying taxes on dividends paid out by that subsidiary company to its stockholders. In other words, Wayne must ensure the holding company owns 80% or more of any subsidiary for payment between the entities to be considered a liquidity transfer within one business enterprise. Rule number three, pay attention here. This is a really important and nuanced one. Wayne ensures he avoids the accumulated earnings tax and the personal holding company tax. If you're not familiar with these IRS provisions, you are in for some light reading. The accumulated earnings tax can be found under sections 531 through 537, and the personal holding company tax can be found under sections 541 through 547 of the code. But say for instance, Wayne has expanded his operations and he has elected Hold Co. to be treated as a C-Corp for tax purposes because he wants to take full advantage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which reduced the highest rate of income tax on corporations from 35% down to 21%. But the government does not want someone like Wayne to utilize his holding company as a means to shelter his accumulated earnings indefinitely without taxation. Uncle Sam won't like that. The accumulated earnings tax is a 20% tax on the accumulated taxable income of corporations and outside of its enumerated exemptions, Wayne could be out an additional 20% on accumulated earnings and profits that he has failed to distribute at the end of his fiscal year on any amount beyond what the statute calls reasonable business needs. The personal holdings tax is also a 20% tax, which is easier for the government to apply to Wayne because it only needs to prove Hold Co. meets the stock ownership requirement and the gross income requirement as defined in the sections previously cited. The good news is, if the personal holdings tax applies, the accumulated earnings tax does not. They are never duplicative. The bad news is, proper tax planning is essential and a requirement to avoid those taxes as failure to self-assess can result in steep penalties. Knowing this, Wayne intelligently plans out how his quarterly payouts are managed in conjunction with how his earnings are reinvested in his other subsidiaries to really easily minimize this tax obligation. Now, Wayne's business structure is relatively straightforward and his reinvestment goals and payout goals are easy to manage. But depending on your business structure, there is potential for complexity here and I highly recommend everyone 
to hire a competent CPA to help you plan and navigate. But the two general options are either, one, ensure the, your corporation does not meet the legal definition under the stock ownership tests, or two, ensure regular, timely dividend payments that drastically reduce or eliminate the tax completely. In Wayne's circumstance, there is no reason why he wouldn't be able to do this. Look, there's a lot of BS out there. People peddling erroneous information or dangerously incomplete information. Always do your own research, do your own due diligence, and never wholly rely on some guy on YouTube, regardless of credentials or net worth. Even if you've retained the services of an extraordinary lawyer or CPA whose skill and knowledge you've come to trust implicitly, the only way you become better at problem solving is if you understand the lenses through which the professional views the problem. The moment you stop learning is the moment you begin to become irrelevant. I'm gonna be posting free content regularly. My core belief is that financial and legal information should be accessible to everyone and not behind some gate-kept institution. That anyone who desires financial success and is willing to work hard and smart to obtain it will succeed. Cream will always rise to the top regardless of where it starts. And open information is a prerequisite towards the ideals of a true meritocracy. If the information I provided today has been helpful or entertaining to you, and you'd like to see more, please do me the favor and hit that like and subscribe. Until next time. Nice. Well done, well done.